House of the Dead 2 for the Wii Game Review. So, the bad guy from the first one, the mad scientist Curin, is of course dead, and that's not really a spoiler even if you haven't played the first game, because he's a bad guy in a stereotypical video game. Of course he's dead by the end of the game. Anyway, we need a new villain, of course, so enter Goldman. That's just his name, Goldman. I don't think he has a first name, it's, it's like Cher, I guess. Goldman enjoys long walks to the corpses of dead villains from the first game, introducing him as the retcon villain of the series, I guess. He likes to introduce someone to their death, only to then finish off by saying that he hopes to see them again sometime. And when he gets really agitated, his voice cracks and he sounds exactly like Mr. Bean. Goldman, yeah, I'm not gonna reveal his motives here, although they are hilariously illogical. He, you know, gets into the zombie making business, or I guess he just continues on the zombie making business. He makes it, you know, He's, he's a businessman, suit-wearing businessman, so he, I don't know, makes it an industry, I guess, and there are more zombies this time. And this time, it's not a house, making the title make absolutely no sense, but a city, basically. So, in come some new AMS agents, and they're now identified as AMS, I'm not sure what AMS stands for, but at least now we know what they're working for. Now, these are not the same guys as in the first one, but I believe you meet... Yeah, you meet the, you know, the second guy from the first one, G. You know, you meet him very early on, and he's, excuse me, he's like wounded, and then a little later on, you pass some bloodstains, and for some reason, I believe Harry is the name of the main agent, can tell that that blood is G's blood stains. I don't know, he has DNA vision, I guess. I will get more into the dialogue. But yeah, so these two guys, and we might as well just say two guys, because the dialogue will be exactly the same, whether they're, you know, if the second guy isn't, if you're playing it as a single player, there just won't be a second person to say those lines. But literally, the first line, Harry says, wait, Harry, no, Scratch that. The first line that player one character says literally is, we're meeting G over there. I don't know. I guess he has multiple personality disorder or something. Anyway, yeah, they have to rid the city of as many zombies as they can and make their way to Goldman's headquarters. I'm going to start with the positives because... <laughs> It's gonna be a just avalanche once I get to the negatives. I suppose the very first thing I should say is, you know, I'm, this is for the Wii. You can get it for the PC, I believe, but you'll want to get it for the Wii. In fact, if you like this sort of game at all, and once again, it's a rail shooter, you might want to get a Wii just to be able to play this. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of this particular game myself, but if you like rail shooters, this is a rail shooter that actually functions as a rail shooter on the Wii. And there's not a lot to say about the release for the Wii. There's this slightly annoying thing where sometimes things are at the very edges of the screen. And I don't know why, but on the Wii you can't point to the very edges of the screen. It'll try to reload and you just you can't hit something that's there. So. You just gotta hope that nothing reaches the end of the screen, or you gotta take that hit. There's really not a lot you can do about it. Other than that, sometimes it gets a little wonky with the calibration, but you can always recalibrate. You know, I think you do have to go to the menu. I don't remember if you can do it in-game, but it does have a calibration feature, and it functions quite well. Now, you'll 
of course want to you know not just be pointing your Wii mode but actually stick it into something you could get a Wii zapper if you don't mind looking like a dork and if you're playing a Wii motion game I guess you don't mind that but if you do want to be a bit more cool you might want to get this little number which it just functions really well and it actually you know as you yeah, any gun aficionados will be able to tell you that's it looks like an actual gun. I think it's a Walter P99, something like that, you know. James Bond's gun before James Bond turned blonde, you know. The the more recent James Bond before the even more recent James Bond. Now, if you care less about, you know, your wrist taking a substantial amount of trauma while playing, you might even want to get this number, which will also allow you to feel positively pimp while playing. I apologize, I realize I'm way too white for that phrase. Now, the positives. This does have better graphics than the first one. And the gore a lot of the way has returned, although on the very last level there's suddenly no gore for some reason and some of the gore looks like painted on. It looks like bad Halloween makeup kind of thing, especially when it's like bones poking out and stuff like that. So on that, I gotta say the gore is better than the first one. But yeah, anyway. And yeah, I'm gonna get into explicit gore details in this one as well. So yeah, this review isn't for children. And neither is the game. Yeah, so the, the graphics are better, you know, you've got more realistic, you know, in the first one there are like graphic glitches where the neck is supposed to be, or where limbs connect in general, and this one has considerably less of that, nearly none of that. The characters are more diversely dressed and move a bit more realistically, there's still no lip movement, but, you know, the faces look more real, you know, they're not just pixel you pixels you can sort of project some emotion behind the and you do gotta do it yourself because the the acting I'll get to that the game is longer and thus there is more of everything there is in the first games which also goes for the goofy aspects I will get to those but that does mean there are more different paths so there's a bit more replayability in this one. It also allows, of course, for more settings and it opening up to an entire city again, which I don't even think they quite had the tech for with the first one, going by the comparatively limited scope. So, you know, you start out in just at a street, you go through some buildings, you know, there's, there's intersections, you you go to a Colosseum. I don't know how many cities have Colosseums by them, but there is one in this game, and it looks great. It's actually a really... it's one of the best segments of the game, actually, because it is by far one of the greatest boss concepts, both in just idea and execution, in this entire series. You know, most of the best ones are in the first, but in this one, I'm, I refuse to give away what it is, but it is just, it's worth playing the game just for that. It is, you know, the, the one thing is just the, the creature and the form, but also just the incredibly cinematic way that it attacks. And it's, it's one of the most intense segments of any of these games, and by far one of the most memorable. We have, you know, there's, there's water bridges, there's this, there are ruins of old stuff, you know, there's a high-tech building there at the very end, so, you know, nicely varied. It is also, like I said, it's a longer game, it's like twice, maybe three times as long as the first game, which does eventually really, I, I'd say this is at the very limit of what your wrist and your fingers can handle. If you play for longer than what this game is, like, you know, if you've just completed it, if you've just completed the first one, you might 
go back and play it one more time, but with this one, you're not going to be wanting to play anything that really strains your fingers and your wrists for a while, you know, especially when you're using, you know, the, the when you're playing it on the Wii or I guess at the arcade if you find somewhere that has it. You know, holding up that gun for that long and pressing the trigger, you know, actively, not just pre clicking a button that many times might not sound like much, but it does strain your, you know, muscles and, yeah. The, the music and sound is great, you know, the monsters sound like monsters. These do not, you do, do not feel any hesitation towards shooting these things apart, you know. There is no doubt in your mind that what you are shooting is not human. Maybe some of it used to be, it ain't anymore. No doubt about that. And the music, you know, works well with the, you know, the, the energy. And we have more dynamic, you know, stuff in this one as well. Returning briefly to the settings, two times in this you, you're actually in a vehicle moving while shooting, you know, and yeah, that's pretty cool, you know, and again, the first one didn't have that. So, you know, you're on, a, you're on a boat and you're in a car at two different points in this game. It also does a quite nice job, I think it does a better job than the first one, frankly, of supplying enough enemies if you're playing two players and at the same time not having too many, play not having too many enemies if you're only one player. So, that's very positive. It's you know, as well. Obviously, you don't want to be neither overwhelmed nor underwhelmed on that. And this is when we get into the bad. The game really doesn't, it's, it's nowhere near as tense as the first one. I suppose we get some tension out of how, how dangerous sort of the enemies are. Again, the fact that it's a longer game doesn't actually change how many lives and continues you have. So, you you know, your lives now has to last two or three times as long. That, of course, makes it inherently tense, somewhat. But, so much of this is just not very tense, you know. It's, it's much less cinematic. It's much less... I don't know, crowded is maybe a good word for how many zombies there are and such. You spend too much time just walking with no zombies. Like in the first one, yeah, it's 15 minutes long, only 15 minutes, but they cram at least one zombie into practically every frame. You can't move anywhere. You can't, you can't even like look somewhere without there being a zombie. You know, you can't turn around, open a door, go anywhere without there being a zombie, and in this one, so much of it, I don't know, maybe they thought it would be too much. Frankly, I'd have preferred a shorter game. Heck, how about this? Make three, like, campaigns, and each of them you fill with zombies. So you'd have, like, three times the first game, and it would be as much fun as the first game. In this, there's just so much less reason to be terrified, you know, and... That brings me to how goofy it is, because that's also a really big part. I think I should start with just the, the dialogue, as promised, and the acting. We again get these just hokey and strange lines. I mean, you can get like cheesy lines in American games, but the Japanese, they can provide lines that don't even make sense, at least to us Westerners. I mean, obviously, I can only speak for myself. To me, these things make no sense. You know, they'll meet, they'll face off against a boss, and they'll have this ridiculous one-liner. It's not even like an Arnie one-liner, which would at least be fun. It's just the kind of thing where you're going, "Yeah, I beat that." Huh? What did he just say? And and it's just, it's frankly distracting with just how how dumb these things. You know, it's again like fortune cookie logic, or logic, moral lessons kind of thing, you know, there's one bit where, you know, a boss says to you that, you know, you have no fate, you, you have no future, and then after you kill it, 
the response, you know, the one-liner will be, only man himself can control his fate, you're nothing. Okay, wow, ooh, burn. And in, in general, just the, the lines, you know, that's, that's one of the two kinds of dialogue in this. The other is this just, yeah, the, the Western American Hollywood obvious dialogue, kind of, you know, just really stereotypical. There's a lot of, like, I don't want to call it exposition because it's really not. It's just stating the obvious. Like, the player knows from cutscenes that Goldman is behind it. So when the agents, you know, you meet two other agents, that's where I got the name Harry. Ooh, Harry. Harry and J Julie or something? I don't remember. She's nowhere near as much. Yeah, I'll get to Harry in a bit. And they explain to you, you know, ooh, Goldman is behind it. And you're like, yeah, I already know this. And yeah, there's not even like... Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of background, like, I actually, I feel a little bad for saying this because this is what I wanted more of in the first game, but now I realize I, I should have just been happy with what I had, you know, be careful what you wish for, because this is what they have to offer in, you know, background and exposition and that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, in the first game when they had these brief little interludes, at least they were cinematic, at least they were cool looking, you know, yeah, they were saying dumb stuff, but at least, you know, at the same time, they were shooting open a door, or, you know, jumping into something, something, but in this, it's just this painful dialogue, and you're just, and yeah, I know you can skip it, but it's actually a little more fun to listen to it, at least once, just to, you know, see, you know, just to have that, did I actually just hear that kind of experience? A lot. Harry. Harry is one of the really good examples of the bad acting. At times, it does not sound like Harry understands the words that are coming out of his mouth. I don't know if they just grabbed some random guy off the street and had him record this dialogue, which he saw for the first time, or what, but literally, every nearly everything he says, you're just, it, it doesn't sound like he has any idea what he's actually saying. Maybe they got someone Japanese to just, you know, read it phonetically. That would actually make a lot of sense, considering his delivery. And then, you know, Goldman is also pretty painful with, you know, he, when he says the word friends, which he's, you know, he's obviously supposed to be taunting them, you know, they're not his friends, really. It's like sarcasm or something, but... The way he says the word friends, it sounds like he's trying to make sense of the meaning of it. Like when Frankenstein's monster says it, you know. Yeah, I suppose that pretty well covers it for the... Actually, last little bit about the acting and the dialogue. Practically every time a civilian, and to their credit, the civilians actually now don't wear just white clothing. They wear like normal people clothes. You know, which does also make them harder to spot sometimes. But again, that's, you know, part of the enjoyment of it. The civilians, when asking, you know, help me, they won't be saying help me. They'll be saying help me. Like, you know, don't help that other person who's never actually, there's never another person. You know, it's always one civilian who's saying help me. And he's saying it like as if there's some person you you could be helping or something I don't know I, possibly the most fun or maybe that's just me is when you know player one character says what when something unexpected happens you know when a boss turns up out of nowhere or something he doesn't say it like huh or like what is going on he says it like what? What did I do now? It's like, it's like when Ash says the incantation wrong. It's like, oh, what? What? Come on. It's freaking hilarious. I, I, I have no idea if they were trying to be this campy and cheesy. I don't think you could 
be this campy and cheesy if you tried. I think it, ha it has to happen by just happy accident. The... Granted, the boss enemies aren't bad, although the designs are just strange this time. I, you know, again, the Japanese were great at creating these monsters, but in this one, they're kind of weird. I will say that they're better than the third one, but yeah, I'll get to the third one. The difficulty does, you know, arc reasonably well in the boss fights and in the levels themselves. Although the very last one is not necessarily the most difficult one, and some of them, you know, in a lot of, a lot of boss fights in video games there are like several... you know, they'll get like increasingly more difficult to defeat as the fight goes on. You know, they'll break out even more desperate and dangerous attacks. And this, some of the most you know, some of the later stages of these, excuse me, boss enemies are really the most easy, so that's a little off. I suppose that is more or less what there is to say. There are a couple of new zombies, and you know, sort of elaborations on old designs. A bunch of them are returning ones who've just, like, been, you know, they've gotten different skins. You know, video game people will know that. Well, their appearance is slightly different, but it's clearly the same zombie, you know. It's like, I killed you last week. What's, you know, what is this? <sighs> yeah, I suppose that it's pretty much all there is to say about the game. Yeah, so hope you enjoyed it as well as I did. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.